Welcome to video of lecture B11. This one is on the rank of a matrix. I'll be your lecturer, Tom Roby, and here are the outline and objectives. We want to define the row space of a matrix. We've talked a lot about the column space of a matrix. Now we want to define the row space of a matrix and analyze how row operations affect it. Um, then we'll define the rank of a matrix to be the dimension of the column space, with this measure of size, how big is the column space of a matrix. And we'll prove that it's the same as the dimension of the row space of the matrix. So that's one of the big theorems of linear algebra, actually, that row rank equals column rank. And it's not at all obvious from first principles. Um, sometimes that theorem is called the rank theorem. Uh, the textbook we're currently using uses the rank theorem to refer to two different things, both this theorem and what's sometimes called the rank nullity theorem. Nullity is another word for the dimension of the null space. And what it says is that the rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A is equal to the number of columns in the matrix. You could think of this more symmetrically as the dimension of the column space of A plus the dimension of the null space of A is equal to the number of columns in the matrix. So these are two of the six great um, theorems of linear algebra, according to Gil Strang. And so here's the definition of a row space of a matrix. So let's take any m by n matrix, and we'll define the row space of A to just to be the span of all the rows of A. Now, since this is an m by n matrix, that means it's got m rows, n columns, and so each row is a vector of length n, so that lives inside R to the n. Equivalently, this isn't really a very different concept. You can just take the transpose of the matrix and look at the column space, right? Because you'll just be interchanging rows and columns when you do that. And so the span of the rows becomes the span of the columns of a transpose. OK. So let's look at an example. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this example because this is a, this will, analyzing this carefully will give us exactly the result that we want to explain. So I've got a 4 by 5 matrix. And so the row space of A is spanned by these four vectors. Now, as we often do, we try to, to understand the matrix better. We put it into row reduced echelon form, which I display here. So what's the relationship between the row space of A and the row space of B? Well, what I claim is that when you do an elementary row, a series of a sequence of elementary row operations, you don't actually change the span of the rows. Because every row that you create is a linear combination of the rows you already had. So you can't actually get anything that you didn't already have in the span. right? So think about it. If you interchange two rows, you're not doing anything to the span. If you rescale a vector, well, you can just take, you're taking any linear combinations you want. You can just re-rescale by something else, the inverse of the thing you scaled by. Um, and then the crucial one is that if you add a multiple of one row here to another, well, you're just getting a new vector that's a linear combination of the vectors that you already had. Okay? And so you do this multiple times, and you get things that are you know, more and more complicated linear combinations of your original vectors, but they still are. So you haven't made your span any bigger. So what my argument has just shown is that the span of, of B is a subset of the span of A. I can't get anything new by doing these row operations. But the key thing here is that every elementary row operation, its inverse is also an elementary row operation. So that means that row equivalence goes back and forth. So I can take every vector in here is a linear combination of vectors here. So that means the span of these vectors can't be any bigger than the span of these vectors. Okay? So the spans of those sets of vectors has to be the same. That's the bottom line. Okay? So now that makes my life really easy because I couldn't quite tell what all the, I, you know, I, I can say this is a span of four vectors, but maybe some, there's some linear dependencies in here that I don't know about. And in fact, looking at B, I can tell that there are. Because the dimension of the row space of this is exactly three. Right? The zero vector doesn't contribute anything. So I've got these three vectors. And I claim that it's clear that they're linearly independent. Right? Why is that? Well, you know, suppose I had some linear combination of them, right? Suppose I, I had something like, you know, alpha times, let me write them over here. Suppose I had alpha times this vector plus beta times this vector plus gamma times this vector, and I added that linear combination and I got zero, okay? Well, then what would happen is that I'd have, look in the first coordinate, I'd have alpha times one plus zero plus zero equals zero if I had a linear dependence. 
but that means alpha is equal to zero. And if I had beta, well, if I look in the second corner and I have beta plus zero plus zero is equal to zero. So that, that proves that beta equals zero, and similarly, gamma equals zero. So the only way I can have alpha times the first row plus beta times the second row plus gamma times the third row is equal to zero is if alpha, beta, and gamma are all individually zero. Okay? So that, so it's obvious from the way this, you know, this echelon form, this staircase form of a matrix, that the pivot rows, um, which really just means the non-zero rows, every, every row is a pivot row or it's a zero row once you've got, once you're in row, row reduced echelon form, that those rows are linearly independent. And they span by the argument we, well, they obviously span the row space of B, but they also span the row space of A, right, but what we, by what we just say. So these three vectors, the top three vectors here, the non-zero vectors, are a basis for the row space of both A and B, all right? And so that's, that's the key result, and I just really proved, sketched the proof for you, right? Just using this example. So if two matrices are row equivalent, like this, then the row spaces have to be equal. Because all you're doing is, every, every new vector you create when you do row reduction is a linear combination of the ones that you already had. On the other hand, um, if this is in row reduced echelon form, then the non-zero rows of B form, form a basis because they're linearly independent, and of course they span. You don't need the zero vectors to be part of your span. That's always completely redundant. Okay, so this is kind of a nice theorem, and it's, um, let's just contrast it. Well, we remember what a basis for the column space of A would be. So if I'm interested in the column space of, of A, then things, life's a little different, right? Because when I do elementary row operations, I change the column space. And that's obvious, right, even from this example, because if you look at the span of these five vectors, there are certainly some vectors that have non-zero fourth component here, right? Like even just this vector itself has, has two in the fourth component. But there's no way to write a linear combination of these five vectors that has anything but a zero fourth component, okay? So the span of these five columns is not the same as the span of those five columns, so their column spaces are completely different. But remember, what gets preserved by row operations is the set of solutions, homogeneous solutions, and that set of homogeneous solutions is characterizes all of the linear dependence and independence relations. So it's easy to see that these, these columns here, one, two, and four, the columns with pivots in it, those columns are linearly independent, right? By the same kind of argument I just gave, just look at it, look at it sideways. And it's also clear that these rows for free variables, 1 minus 2, and that these are linear combinations of those other rows, okay? So then you can see, like, these, these, these things look basically like the standard basis vectors. So that's, a, that's another clue. Um, but remember, so it's clear that the, the column space of B has a basis rows, columns 1, 2, and 4. And because linear dependence and independence is preserved, those things must be a, the same columns must be linearly independent over here. And, similar, and these, in columns 3 and 5, must be linearly de dependent on columns 1, 2, and 4 in the same way that they are over here. And you can check all of this out. You can, you know, notice that, you know, this vector minus 2 times this vector, or, or sorry, minus this vector plus 2 times this vector plus this vector equals 0. The same thing will be true over here, okay? So that means that if I want a, a basis for the column space, and this is something we've already seen, that I need columns 1, 2, and 4. Those are going to be the three columns that I pick to be a basis of the column space. Okay? So it's a very different, different thing. And I just want to highlight this as one, using the dangerous curve symbol. If I want to compute the row space of A, then if I want a basis for the row space of A, then I have to use the rows of the row reduced echelon form B, not of A itself. But for the column space of A, I have to use, I have to use B to figure out what are my pivot columns and then go back to the original A. And this is something that perennially trips people up and it's usually there's a problem that relates to this on the final exam. So it's good to get this straightened out now and just make sure you're clear on all of these things.
Okay. All right. So next, now that we've seen uh, how row operations affect the row space, we'd like to define the rank of a matrix. So I'm just going to define it to be the dimension of the column space of A. And I want you to always have in mind when you're thinking about this, this basic idea that we can have a linear transformation between blobs. So I'll think about this as being R to the N. And it maps to R to the M. And that's what happens when you look at the linear transformation. X goes to A times X. So I'm thinking about A as a linear transformation. And so the dimension of the column space, what's the column space? Well, the column space is the set of all places that it's the range of this linear transformation, right? So, so there's some set of things that some set of things that everything goes to, right? That may or may not be all of R to the M. And so this is the range of the column space of A. It's the same thing as. And so the rank of this is just whatever the dimension of that is sitting inside R to the M. And so here's the, the rank theorem. And this is really two of the great theorems of linear algebra combined into one statement. So if I've got an M by N matrix, then first of all, the dimension of the row space of A is equal to the dimension of the column space of A, which of course I just defined to be the rank. And let's just go back and recall that that's what happened in this example, right? Where we had um, three, a basis of three rows for the row space and a basis of three columns for the column space. Okay? Um, and that is, of course, equal to the number of pivots in A, right? Because we had pivot rows for the row space, pivot columns for the column space. But also, the rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A is equal to the number of columns, is equal to N. Okay, so symmetrically, you would think about is this dimension of the row space plus the dimension of the null space is equal to N. So that's a really somewhat surprising and non trivial result about any matrix. Uh, but we understand this pretty well thanks to uh, all of our experience with row reduction, because each column of A either contains a pivot corresponding to a basis vector of column space of A, or it corresponds to a free variable which corresponds to a basis vector of the null space of A. And there are n columns. And so that's all there is. Right? And if we just go back quickly and look at this example again, we see right, that there were, right, in A, we have three one, columns 1, 2, and 4 correspond to a basis. And then columns 3 and 5 correspond to free variables. Um, and so for each free variable, I can write you know, x1 and x2 and x4 can be written in terms of x3 and x5, and so x3 and x5 will be the parameters, and each of those will correspond to a basis element, as we've done many times in coming up with the, the solutions to a system of linear equations. Okay, So that's the rank theorem. Um, and it's, it's not, not hard to see anymore, and it's a beautiful theorem. And let's just look at something you know, interesting that, that it can say. You know, suppose I have a 5 by 11 matrix. All right? So that means that I'm going from R11 into R5. What can I say about the dimension of the null space? So you know, maybe here, so I'll tell you that here n equals 11 and m equals 5. And you say, what can you say now in this situation? Um, well, certainly the null space can't be more than 11 dimensional, somewhere between 0 and 11 dimensional. But you can say much more than that. Because how big? can the dimension of the column space be? Well, it can't be more than five dimensional because you're going into R5. Another way of thinking about it is that, right, you've got, if I, what does your matrix look like in the five by 11 case? Well, you've got five things here and 11 things here. And so you've got a bunch of vectors um, here of length five. So if I look at the span of a bunch of vectors of length five, I can't go into R to the you know, they, can, they can't be more than five dimensional. Or equivalently, if I'm looking at the rows, since row rank equals column rank, I have exactly five vectors. So the span of five vectors can't be more than five dimensional. It can be less if there's some linearly, linear dependence relations. Okay. So in any case, so for this matrix, it's clear that so the rank of A is less than or equal to five. Okay. But um, the rank plus the dimension of the null space is equal to 11. All right, so I have you know, 11 plus 11 is equal to um, 5 plus the dimension of the null space, 
or maybe something less than 5. So that means the dimension of the null space is 6 if it's 5, it's 7 if it's 4. So the upshot is that um, if this is less than or equal to 5, then this has to be greater than or equal to 6. Okay. So you've got at least six dimensions worth of solutions to the homogeneous system of equations that that corresponds to. Okay. Let's look at another example that's couched in sort of real world terms, the kind of thing that might be a toy example of something you might encounter in your future work. Suppose an engineer has found five solutions to a homogeneous system of 50 equations and 54 variables. You know, often in science you need to deal with a lot of different variables and a lot of different equations. If none of her solutions is a linear combination of the other four, can she be sure that she can solve any inhomogeneous system, right, ax equals b, not necessarily zero, that uses the same coefficients? Okay. So how do we think about a problem like this? Well, if I've got a 50 equations and 54 variables, that means it's a 50 by 54 matrix. So now we're thinking about, okay, I'm, I'm going from R54 and I'm going over here to R50. Okay? So what does that mean? Um, she knows, since she's found five dimensions worth of solutions, right? She's found linearly inequivalent. So there, there's at least five dimensions of solutions. Okay, so the dimension of the null space of A is bigger than or equal to 5. Okay? But this plus the rank of A is equal to um, the number of columns, which is 54. Okay? So therefore, the rank of A is less than or equal to 49. If there are some solutions that she didn't discover, then you could have a bigger null space and a smaller rank. Okay? But even if you assume that she found them all, then the rank of A would be exactly 49. Okay? So what does that mean? I've got a matrix that's going into R50. Its column space is 49 dimensional. Right? That means that if I pick a random vector in 50 dimensional space, the probability that it actually falls into this 49-dimensional space is zero, actually. So she can't be sure at all. In fact, the probabilities are against her that she can solve any inhomogeneous, you know, inhomogeneous system because saying that the rank of A is less than or equal to 49 says that this is 49-dimensional, and that means that there are plenty of Bs living outside the image of A, living outside the things that A maps to. Okay, so. And, you know, just think about it. I mean, even, even in a smaller example, if you have a matrix who's mapping into R3, right, three-dimensional space, but its column space is two-dimensional, some plane, you pick a random point in R3, what's the probability you're actually going to fall on, on that plane, right, in all of three-dimensional space? Okay, so that's the kind of argument I'm trying to, to give you here for just roughly why you should expect it to be very unlikely. Now, it could be that, that she's only looking for solutions for certain kinds of Bs that already fall in the set, but that would be more than this problem tells us. Okay? So that's the, that's how the rank theorem comes up in various kinds of uh, problem solving. Okay, so I'm, I know this video lecture is getting slightly long, but I didn't quite see a good way to break it apart, so I just want to tell you quickly about some additions to the invertible matrix theorem. So remember, we had this invertible matrix theorem that said if we have a square matrix, and now we're in the n by n case, then we have a bunch of equivalent statements to the matrix being invertible, right? It was row equivalent to the identity matrix. It had n pivot positions. The only solution to ax equals 0 was trivial. The columns are linearly independent. The columns span r to the n. The map, the linear transformation that it corresponds to is on to, 1 to 1. Um, the transpose is invertible, there are one-sided inverses. All of those things were equivalent to the matrix being invertible, meaning that if it's invertible, all of these hold, and if any of these holds, it's also invertible, right? So these are all if and only if the equivalent statements. 
So now what we'd like to do is now that we've got this language of column space, row space, and rank, we'd like to add in a bunch more. And you'll see that these are mostly pretty easy extensions to see. And so I'll just take a couple of two minutes here to sh share with you why you shouldn't be surprised of any of these, right? OK, so the way this game works now is if I want to show a bunch of these statements are equivalent, I can show that I can get from this statement into anything green and from the green into out to here. Or if I can get within things that I've already, if I can show that these are equivalent within themselves and that one of them is equivalent to something here, then I'm good. Um, so I'll just take the, the easiest possible pass. Well, you know, if I know that the columns of A span R to the N, then since, um, then since they're N columns, that's the right number. So spanning is enough to ensure it's a basis. So that proves that. On the other hand, if they're a basis, the columns are a basis, then obviously they span. Okay, so 10 and 14 are equivalent. Saying that the column space of A is equal to R to the N is basically saying that the columns of A span R to the N. So that's another equivalent thing. Um, saying that the dimension of the column space is equal to N. Well, if the dimension of the column space is N, then that means it has to be all of R to the N. And so it has to, right, I mean, this is, th these are just trivially equivalent. Um, saying that the rank of A equals N, well, that's just the dimension of the column space. So those are definitionally equivalent. Saying that the null space of A is zero, well, you know, you, that follow, that's equivalent to four, right? Saying that you have only the trivial solution. And saying that the dimension, null space of A is equal to zero is the same as the dimension of the null space is equal to zero. Well, the only zero dimensional vector space is the zero vector space. So um, there's really not, not much to say about this. Um, and, but it's useful to, to know that there are these other things that are equivalent for a square matrix to invertibility. Um, you know, and so for example, if you know that, you know, if I had told you earlier on in the course, suppose the columns of a matrix are linearly independent, what about the rows? Well, now you can say, well, that means the rows are linearly independent too, because row rank equals column rank. Um, and there are, you could, you know, say th more things about a transpose and more things that, which are equivalent to saying a lot of things about the row space instead of, mostly we talk about column spaces here. Um, but then you kind of end up doubling the number of theorems here because you'd have one statement for A and one statement for A transpose. So it's based better just to think A transpose is also invertible, which means all of these statements also apply to A transpose. But there's no real point in writing them down. Um, so I think that's it for this video lecture. Thank you very much for your kind attention.